on this special two-part episode of the Haunted Objects podcast. Can you imagine writing a super pissed off letter and then having to put it in the mail? Dude, what? <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, we're so used to just being able to like, argue with people on Twitter, but just being like, right, God. You know what the worst and part then about that is? Holding it and putting it in an envelope, <laughs> licking the envelope, like putting it in a mailbox. That's and, so funny. And then you have like a solid four days to regret it. <laughs> Immediately, you're like, I definitely overreacted. <laughs> From deep inside the mysterious archives of the New Kirk Museum of the Paranormal, it's the Haunted Objects Podcast. Would you bring back dinosaurs if you could? No. Why? Because human beings are awful and Jeffrey Bezos would be like, I want to kill one of those. <laughs> you know that that's... <laughs> We're probably going to get demonetized now. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't on Amazon. Well, yeah, it actually is on Amazon Podcasts. We love you, Lord Bezos. Uh, yeah, I I am against the bringing back of dinosaurs only because weird billionaires would want to eat them and kill them. I mean, they already do with, like, woolly mammoths. Yeah. They, they found a woolly mammoth not too long ago, and a bunch of, like, really rich people got to eat the meat. That's just, like, so fucked up. Isn't that crazy? I hate everything about that. Well, okay. Would what, you bring back dinosaurs? Yeah, I would. Yeah, Why? of course. I don't Would know. It'd, be, it'd be amazing. Maybe that's our job. We're getting way into the weeds here. All right. We're going to get further into the weeds today. Yeah, we But are. I want to know what your favorite dinosaur is. I I guess as a Canadian, I'm supposed to say a raptor. Really? Are those Canadian? <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of. They're our basketball team. Oh, shit. <laughs> Did oh. you ask me if, if raptor dinosaurs? I don't know. I thought maybe they found fucking bones for raptors in Canada or something. I don't know. Maybe they did. I don't know. But I know that our oh, basketball team mask. is the Toronto Raptors. So I'm technically supposed to say the Raptors. Do I look like a sports guy to you? <laughs> no, I can't believe you, you know. Also don't. What's strange, though, is that you dress like a dinosaur guy, but you know <laughs> jack shit about dinosaurs. Too. I know a lot about dinosaurs now. <laughs> Not where they're from. <laughs> <laughs> this is very confusing. Oh, Jesus. What is your favorite dinosaur, Greg? So, as, as someone who was raised as a young earth creationist, to, to raised in the church to believe that the earth is only 4,000 years old. Yes. There's a dinosaur that I heard a lot about in church. Yes. And it was the Mokeli and Bembi. Yes. It was a, it was a dinosaur that was uh, supposed to be a living dinosaur hiding out in the heart of the Congo. Mm -hmm. And missionaries used to talk about it all the time because if a living dinosaur exists, well, that means the earth is very young. I'm not a young earth creationist anymore. I just want everyone listening or watching to know this. Hopefully, if you're aware of my work, you know I'm not really into that. But that's how I was raised. And that's how 30% uh, of religious folks are raised. Big yike on that one. Connor, what's your favorite dinosaur? Not really into dinosaurs, but <laughs> velociraptors are pretty cool if I had to pick. Connor's wearing a dinosaur mask for the it's show. It's a kid's mask, and it's like on top of my normal <laughs> face. <laughs> <laughs> Every time he laughs, it's the funniest <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's so scary. It's so scary. <laughs> oh. I can't stop it. <laughs> 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 oh god i kind of hate that to be honest with you <laughs> oh jesus i said earlier it looks like a skexies yeah okay yeah. <laughs> that's a jim henson thing, no it's right? a dinosaur oh okay <laughs> is it from, from canada, canada. yeah <laughs> today we're going to be talking about the mckelly and bemby and we're going to be talking about the incredible history of the people who have looked for the mckelly and bemby the mckelly and bemby itself whether or not a living dinosaur could be a real thing. We have patches from one of the expeditions into the Congo. Today we are talking about Dr. Roy P. Mackle and his quest for evidence of a living dinosaur. 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs went extinct. Or did they? From deep in the heart of the Congo's impenetrable swamps come reports of a massive, unidentified creature known to locals as the one who stops the flow of rivers. Legends of this great beast have trickled out of the jungles of Africa and into books, magazines, and films for over a century, capturing imaginations all over the world. 
Inspired by countless first-hand reports of the long-necked monster, University of Chicago biologist Roy P. Mackle mounted his own hunt for the Mokili Mbembe. But what he discovered was a curse. This colorful mission patch, the only remaining artifact from Mackle's ill-fated Dino Trek expedition, begs the question, could a living dinosaur truly exist? The answer may surprise you. What the f*** is a Michelium Bembe? A semi-aquatic dinosaur mm -hmm. that exists in Lake Telly in the Congo. Okay. Um, I'm going, I know that it's called like the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo now. Um, we're just going to call it the Congo just to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. There's a lake there that is one of the most inaccessible places on the earth. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a, a, surrounded by tons and tons of swamp. It's super difficult to get to. And people around that area have said for many, many years that they are seeing an animal that looks like a brontosaurus. This creature is feared by a lot of people. It's a really weird story that's existed for quite a while, and there have been several expeditions mounted to try and find evidence of this creature uh, to varying degrees of success. Okay. The idea is that somewhere that remote... There are still dinosaurs that have existed and not gone extinct, and the Michele and Bembe is the most popular of them. So they're just hiding out there away from everybody, trying not to be caught. Uh, allegedly, yes. Just, um, like, live in their best life. Sure. I, we don't even, like, this is the weird thing. We don't even know if we're pronouncing this correctly. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Roy Mackle, he says it's pronounced um, Mokele and Bembe, okay. I believe. And Bembe? Anyway, I'm just going to pronounce it the way that I've been pronouncing it. Yeah. So uh, don't uh, don't bother writing in and correcting us. Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to mispronounce a shitload of stuff today. We're going to call it the Bambi boy. There's different ideas on what the translation of Mokeli and Bambi means, but the one that seems to have gotten the most attraction is uh, one who stops the flow of rivers. Okay. Just to say, it's huge. It's, it's a, a big beast. So it's a huge dinosaur-sized beast. Dinosaur. Yeah, it's basically like it's, it's brontosaurus for for lack of a better of a better description. It's basically a brontosaurus, so or maybe an undiscovered animal. We don't know, but it's huge. Whatever it is, is a giant semi aquatic reptile. Okay, it's like that particular breed of dinosaur. Okay, yeah. the long neck ones. Okay, right. um, there have been rumors that these sauropods have existed in Africa since at least the 1700s. There were French missionaries that uh, they, they were tracking animals that had big, round footprints. Um, there were all kinds of, of, of newspaper articles even written from back then that talked about these, en these giant necked creatures that had, some of them had horns on them. The start of the McKelly and Bambi legend really happens in 1909 with this guy, Carl Hagenbach. Carl Hagenbach was not a nice guy. Mm -hmm. He was the guy who was responsible for collecting a lot of the exotic animals for the Ringling Brothers Circus. Yeah, he sucks. He sucks. Uh, there's all kinds of pictures of him out there doing it, like caged polar bears and stuff like that. Totally shitty dude. Well, this guy wrote in 1909 that he had heard legends of a half-dragon, half-elephant creature in Africa. Mm-hmm. That's where a lot of this starts. It wasn't until 1959 when the book Willie Lay's Exotic Zoology was published mm -hmm. that the creature was officially named the McKelly and Bembe. Okay. That's the first mention of the creature. This guy, Willie Lay, was an interesting dude. He was mostly into rockets. Mm -hmm. He wrote a ton of stuff about rocketry, and then occasionally he would write about exotic animals. Like, <laughs> I mean, like, so what? Where he's into explosions and then, like, fucking tigers and shit. Like, no, <laughs> he's basically, like, every dude who's still doing the same thing today. Yes. I love fireworks, and I love caged lions. <laughs> and like I the tiger definitely king. have a mullet. So. <laughs> well, Willie Lay, yeah. he wrote this book, and it has all kinds of stuff. It's got stuff about, like, dragons. It's got stuff about the abominable snowman, giant squids. Awesome. Cryptozoology stuff, basically, yeah. is yeah. what this book is about. But it's the first official mention of the Mokeli and Bembe where it is named. Willie Lay heard about a long-necked dinosaur from a German explorer. He claims that it was referenced in an earlier German manuscript. 
But the book actually says, this is what the book actually says. The dinosaur is said to be of a brownish gray color with a smooth skin. Its size is approximately that of an elephant. It is said to have a long and very flexible neck and only one tooth, but a very long one. My, this is my favorite detail. <laughs> it kind of sounds like the purple people eater, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I literally just pick like picture the doofiest like right. dinosaur ever with just one giant tooth, <laughs> like a big square tooth in the well, front. Some people say that it's a horn. Ah. So so it could be a tooth, it could be a horn. A few spoke about a long muscular tail like that of an alligator. Canoes coming near it are said to be doomed. The animal is said to attack the vessels at once to kill the crews but without eating the bodies. It's said to live in the caves that have been washed out by the river. It is said to climb the shores even at daytime in search of food and its diet is said to be entirely vegetable. So, so it's, it's a, a vegetarian. It's a vegetarian. Like a brontosaurus. Yeah, exactly. Exactly like a brontosaurus. Yeah. So that is is where a lot of what we knew about the Michele and Bambi came from okay. in the late 50s. And that's the type of information that was inspiring a lot of white dudes yeah. <laughs> from America uh-huh. to want to go and find this dinosaur. Discover this undiscovered dino. There was a weird thing that started to happen in uh, the early 1900s. Massive dinosaur craze. Yeah, everybody was really psyched about dinosaurs at this point. Yeah. They're like, we we love them. We want more of them. We want them to be real. We want them to be around. Well, Let's go and, get some. And part of the reason for that is this was when we really started to dig up a lot of dinosaur bones. Oh, okay. And had uh, some of the science to understand that the where these things came from. Yeah. And that there were giant creatures that walked the earth. So That's cool. A lot of museums were racing to go out there and collect these bones and put them together. Because they wanted to be like top dog museum with the coolest bones. Absolutely. Okay. It got a lot of museums into trouble. There's some like I'm sure it did. <laughs> real hack jobs where they just grabbed a bunch of shit and yeah. threw it together and you've got these crazy <laughs> things that could never possibly exist. They're like, no, this is a real dinosaur. <laughs> and it's yeah. just a bunch of uh, different animals all stuck together. Yeah. Around the time, 1950s, 1959, is when a lot of people started to circulate rumors that the Mokelly and Bembi existed uh, in Lake Telly. Yes. Lake Telly, as we were talking about earlier. Could we call it the most metal place on Earth? It kind of sounds it's, that way. It's a nightmare of like hot, muggy water, yeah. swamp water stuff probably swims up your pee hole. <laughs> it's it, probably got those, yeah. It's definitely got to have those things. Well, it's funny, you know, you talk about the the mugginess. One of the details about Lake Telly is that the climate is so humid yeah. that most of the instrumentation that people bring out there is yeah. destroyed within weeks. So this place is just taking no prisoners. Look like at this. It is literally just... All swamp. So, it's, it's nearly impossible to get to. They can't build roads into it. Yeah. It's like seven feet deep swamp, most of it. Before you even get to the body of water itself. Yeah. I know everyone thinks like, what is it? The Mariana Trench is like the most metal <laughs> place on earth. I disagree. I think it is Lake Telly. Well, Lake Telly is really the only the best photos that you can get of it are by plane. Yeah. There's no really easy way to get to it. Yes. It's so remote that if there was a dinosaur, this is probably where it would be. I mean, here's the thing. It totally makes sense. Like we're talking about a place that is so uninhabitable that it is the perfect spot for something like that to exist. Human beings can't exist there. It's literally the perfect hiding spot. To your point. Yeah. In 2007, the Wildlife Conservation Society discovered more than 100,000, 100,000 yeah. previously unreported gorillas living in the swamps and forest around Lake Telly. That's awesome. That's, that's insane. 100,000 unreported gorillas. I love it. If there is a dinosaur, Lake Telly would be the place for it to hang out. It makes absolute sense to me. There's an idea that's, that, that tends to pop its head up every time people are talking about expeditions to places that are uh, remote or unexplored, mm -hmm. particularly in Africa, that the entire continent doesn't have access to modern amenities. Yeah. That's not true. Yeah. Africa's really well developed in many, many places. You can think of Lake Telly and the swamps that surround it, sort of the same way that you'd think of like Mount Everest, right? Yes. There's population centers all over the place. It's just really, really hard to get to. Yeah. 
And because of that, not a whole lot of people want to go there for any particular reason other than, I don't know, to go find a dinosaur. Yeah. You got to really work for it. It's going to be crazy hard to get there. There's like no rivers that lead into that area. So you can't raft in. You got to just like trek through this huge swamp. And there's bugs everywhere, and there's I'm just sure there's like bunch of crazy what is it alligators, alligators out there, right? People who go there are attacked by crazy bees. Yes, they're attacked by crazy bees and other uh, venomous insects that yeah. haven't even been cataloged by scientists uh-huh. yet. A place that human beings are going to have a bad time in. Right, you're going to have a bad time. Right, you're not going to have a good time. Eventually, a guy by the name of Roy P. Mackle heard. About the Mokelly and Bambi. The Mac Man. <laughs> Here he comes. And he he read the book by Willie Lay. <laughs> and My he, favorite name <laughs> on the planet. And he said, this intrigues me. I want to know more. The thing about Roy Mackle was, Roy Mackle was one of the first guys to really take the Loch Ness Monster seriously back in the 50s. Interesting. So kind of popularizing the idea that the Loch Ness Monster is a creature that we can see. Yes. Uh, in fact, he claims to have seen it. Mm-hmm. And that's when he realized, well, I need to I need a new legend to chase. I love that he was like, all right, I'm going to uh, find this incredibly difficult to discover animal. And then he sees it and he's like, I'm on to the next one. <laughs> like he just couldn't be stopped. Uh, he had a Ph.D. from the University of Chicago. His Ph.D. was in biology. So he studied biochemistry and virology. OK. Um, particularly during the 1950s through the 1970s. It says here that he studied bacteriophages and the lysogenic cycle. Okay. Connor, you asked your brother about this. Yeah, no, I asked my nerdy uh, prepping for medical school brother about this. And he said, basically, the way he explained it to me is that, like, that's kind of the study of how viruses and bacteria, like, uh, attack each other, you know, on that really, really microscopic level, Um, which is, and that was his, from his, his, expertise for like 30 years yeah um and so it's kind of poetic that he did that for such a long time and he was a smart guy in it phd uh in biology and all that stuff and then he decided to go from the really tiniest things to a dinosaur (laughs) literal dinosaur so he literally was like no i gotta go to the other end of the spectrum he like he like pac-manned at the end of what he could do with microscopes and ended up on the other side um, with dinosaurs. That's, That's crazy. Cool. It's cool that he has like an entire career and then one day is like, no, I must seek out monsters. Yeah. Like I've got to go for it. Well, one of the things we should probably know is notice he does not have a PhD in zoology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he just, uh, maybe, maybe not the most qualified guy. Sure. To go out and search for an animal. Uh huh. Um, but you know, I'm sure that he, it came in handy when he was dealing with stuff in Africa, like malaria and yeah. things like that. He was just very enthusiastic. We yes. can give him a PhD in enthusiasm. Yes. <laughs> so in the 1960s, he decides he's going to go and look for the Loch Ness monster. By 1965, he was the chief scientist for the Loch Ness Phenomena Investigation Bureau. I love this. He's just rising up in the ranks really fast. <laughs> he He's is. becoming the monster uh, professional as he, fast as possible. We're going to do an entire episode on the Loch Ness Monster. Yes. And we'll talk more about his investigations. But he like had the World Book Encyclopedia buy him a submarine. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, he was taking it seriously. He built a special harpoon so that he could get, like, DNA samples. He, I, for, I, I always think... The, of him as like the Steve Zizou of like yes. monsters. Like if there's any Wes Anderson fans out there. He kind of looks like Steve Zizou He does too. a little bit. Well, in 1970, he claims that he saw the Loch Ness Monster himself. Yeah. And that was enough for him. He was actually, he has a quote here where he said, for me, it was solved. Not really, but hey, I saw it. I don't care if anyone believes me. <laughs> so essentially satisfied. Yeah. <laughs> I'm satisfied. <laughs> He's like, moving on. <laughs> it's there. It's real. I've spent 10 years going after this thing. Yeah. Now I'm going to make things even harder on myself. <laughs> I'm going to the Congo. Yeah. In 1977, another explorer by the name of James Powell told him about the Mokelly and Bembe after okay. Mackle was giving one of his lectures. Yes. And Mackle was so stoked on this story of a living dinosaur that he didn't even wait. He bought tickets immediately before he even had a visa. He was just so jacked out of his mind. He was like, finally. Finally. 
He so uh, he, you said he bought his tickets before getting a visa, which is a bad idea. Yeah, well, I, I think Keelan was the one who read all about this. <laughs> Keelan, didn't he like some woman who was in the audience was like, oh, I was just out there. Yeah, he was somewhere asking about like how to get to the Congo. And yeah. this woman like popped out a line and was like, oh, my God, I was just there. Like, here's the the travel agency that I worked with and blah, blah, blah. He was like, great. And he bought his ticket. <laughs> And then he was like, oh, my God, wait, <laughs> I don't have my visa. And then went to his his buddy, James, and they got it done in like five days. Yeah. He writes about this in A Living Dinosaur in Search of Mokeli and Bembi. This is an insanely hard book to find. Mm-hmm. Uh, this has been in, in our collection for a while. It turns out when we were doing research on this, we went to go find a book to send to Keelan for research. They're like $400. So uh, if you've got a copy of A Living Dinosaur out there, you can make a few bucks. Yep. He writes about this on page 18. He says, from then on, I knew the Loch Ness Monsters existed. The state of mind has remained with me and most certainly has predisposed me to be receptive to reports of other unidentified animals. So that when James Powell first confronted me with reports of the Mokelly and Bemby, I was ready to listen. So it's almost like he needed to see the Loch Ness Monster for him to like be a hundred percent like i'm dedicated to this now like i'm going out there you well, know what i mean like yeah. obviously spending 10 years looking for the Loch Ness monster is evidence in and of itself that he really <laughs> believed in it and cared but it's like at this point he becomes a man possessed he's like i'm going for it yeah i mean he think about that if you if you're a person who maybe has an interest in the unexplained mm-hmm. we'll call it the unexplained and you see evidence that that thing exists good enough for you you're going to want, I mean, you got the bug at that point. Mm-hmm. Like we started out looking for ghosts and then it turned into looking for Bigfoot yeah. and then looking for aliens yeah. and then testing psychic powers. It just kind of happens. Yeah. Like the more evidence you, you get to collect or the strange experiences you get to have, uh, initiate you into the next stage and into the next stage. Yes. And that was what that was for him. Part of what made him so curious about this legend was the fact that there were like 50,000 square miles that were pretty unexplored yeah. in the Congo in this place. So to him, it made sense. It's a little different than Loch Ness where like people have been there forever sure. and they occasionally see this thing. This is a spot where nobody ever really goes. If there's something that exists there that people catch a glimpse of once in a while, not only did he know it was going to be harder to find it, but it would be a bigger scientific discovery because it makes sense. Yeah. This is where it would be. He thought that maybe the idea would be that uh, the climate might not have changed much in 65 million years in that particular area. So maybe that's why a dinosaur could still exist there. Mm -hmm. Um, That's one theory. There were other people who had other theories, but that's what made him so interested in this legend. Are you in possession of a haunted object? An antique spiritualist tool? Wreckage from a crashed UFO? The Newkirk Museum of the Paranormal wants to add it to their archives. Whether your strange item is causing you paranormal problems or is simply a supernaturally significant relic worthy of curation, we want to hear from you. For more information on our acquisition process, visit paramuseum.com. If you want a good idea of Roy Mackle's personality, there's a great video that you can find on YouTube. We'll link it in the show notes. We watched it before this, and I I ha- sort of had my own mental image of who Roy Mackle was. Yeah, I did too. Because part of the reason that we, we are doing this episode is because we have a bunch of his work. Yeah. We have boxes and boxes of his work. We've gone through it all. There's fascinating stuff in there, and it builds this image in your head of this intrepid explorer, an Indiana Jones-type character. That image was shattered Mm -hmm. when we watched this clip of him from Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World. Mm -hmm. It's an old BBC show, and it's him and uh, James Powell, Mm -hmm. who first told him about the McKellie and Bimby, in a taxi in Chicago, 
just rattling off all of this stuff that they're doing to this poor taxi driver. Yeah, they basically have an unwilling captive who's <laughs> unfortunately trapped in the car with them while they are like, sir, look at these photos from this book. And this poor man is just trying to drive this taxi. This do, These two guys may as well have been going to Comic-Con. Yeah. The way that they were talking and acting. Yeah. Uh, you look at it and you're like, oh no, you're going to the jungle. Yeah, I like. It, I was like, oh, it immediately makes me think of the references that people would joke about us in Hellier going oh, yeah. to, like Hellier soft As nerd soft people. Soft nerd people. Yeah, yes. they were soft nerd people. And this poor taxi driver really could not care less about their little dinosaur no. adventure. No, he's just like trying to get them somewhere, but yeah. they needed a way. You can tell that the producers were like, no, just tell the taxi driver about what you're doing, uh -huh. and then that way we've got all the setup that we need for your adventure. Yeah. I feel very bad for him. The huge dorks. Yeah. Humongous Dork. dorks. <laughs> so if you want a good characterization of them, check out the link in the in the show description. It's very, it's kind of cute though. Keelan has been deep in the research <laughs> on these different expeditions. Keelan, what did you find out about their first hunt for a living dinosaur? <laughs> yes. So it's January 1980. Uh-huh. Mackle and Powell, they go to the Congo and they end up meeting up with a missionary named Gene Thomas mm -hmm. and a couple guides that they hire. And they're trying to get to this village called Apina, which is like the closest main settlement outside of Lake Tele. Obviously very difficult to get to, so they want to try to get a plane. And twice this plane does not land because of bad weather. Oh wow! And this is a this is their first trip, so it's gonna it's a fairly short time that they're there, so they're running out of time, and so they decide that they're going to trek through the swamp on foot. Oh my god! What? <laughs> the softest of nerd people are like, we're definitely gonna survive this. From where they were in a town called Imfondo, it's about 60 miles. Oh, they had to go 60 miles through the swamp? Well, yeah, well, so they contact a different village sort of on the way where they're going to meet up and get a, on a boat, and it'll cut off about 16 of those miles. Oh, great. Oh, okay. <laughs> Everyone counts at this point. Right, yeah. exactly. If you can imagine, getting through the swamp really sucked. <laughs> <laughs> At one point, Mackle notices in on his cap there is sweat <sighs> dripping oh off the bill of his oh, hat. Oh, gross! And, and he was an old dude at this point too. Yeah, and he like in the book he's like that can't be my sweat. He's like that can't I can't be sweating that much. And then he checks um, the humidity and the temperature, and it's ninety degrees. And 90% humidity. Oh, oh my, <laughs> my God. God. So basically a sauna. Yeah. They're walking through a sauna. They take frequent breaks and every time they stop, they get swarmed by bugs. Oh, oh my God. God. From what I understand, like they are going through the swamp, but there are small villages sort of on the outskirts of the swamp that they're able to stop at okay. at night. So they're not like camping in the swamp. And then the toughest trek is to get right in the middle of it, right. which is where Lake Telly is. Exactly. So this is all still on the, on the outside diameter right. of the circle. <laughs> and this is still outside of it. So oh you can only God. imagine like what the deeper swamp <laughs> could possibly be like. Everywhere they stop, they're asking people, you know, have you seen, do you know about... This creature, people are like, my grandfather, my grandparents told me about it, but like, oh, wow. I've never seen one. But then some people do claim to have seen it themselves. This one guy said that a couple of years previous, he was in a boat um, on the Licola O. Herbes River. It's very French. I don't know if I'm saying it right. <laughs> um, but he says he sees like a long neck and a head come out of the water about like 30 feet away from him while he's on the river. He says it's like a snake-like head. It's tapering. And he said that it reared its body up out of the water, maybe looking for this fruit called the Malumbo fruit, which everyone says is like the Mokeli and Bembe's favorite fruit or wow. favorite food. Another guy said that when he was 17, he suddenly saw a strange animal surface and the water ran backwards. Weird. Uh, and he describes it very similarly to the Willie Lay book. He says that the body was a reddish brown color. But he said that it had a frill on the top of its head, like a rooster comb. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And he said that he watched it for like three minutes. Another weird 
uh, thing that a lot of people tell him is that, like, there's this idea that people shouldn't talk about Makili and Bembe or else they'll die. Oh, mm. like it's a curse. Yeah. Interesting. But people are still talking to him about it. So I don't know how much <laughs> sure. they really believe that. Uh-huh. Maybe they just weren't uh, very superstitious. Yeah. yeah. He leaves like absolutely convinced that the Makili and Bembe is real. Really? Yeah. And he's going back. And he immediately plans. <laughs> Again. Going, like immediately. I wow. Love, I love this detail because he was just jazzed out of his mind. <laughs> he's like, I'm coming, I'm coming back immediately, like just turning right around and coming right back. I mean, I get it. I get it. I would. I mean, he was a man possessed. He he already found the Loch Ness monster. It's time to go find this dinosaur. He's got to get the next one. So I've got to show everybody this. If you're an audio listener, we'll describe this. But if you're watching on video, you're gonna love this. This is probably the patch is cool, but this is probably one of the coolest things we have from Roy Mackle's collection. Check this out. This here. You can hear me unrolling it. This is Roy Mackle's hand drawn map of his McKelly and Bembe expeditions. It has, uh, it's a little bit faded. Whoever had this in storage didn't treat it all that great, but it's got uh, sightings mapped on it with little asterisks. It's got, here's Lake Telly right here. It shows the routes that they took to get there and uh, all of the different sighting reports. And it's hand-drawn. This I think is the, I amazing. Think, I think there's a big old stain on the back too. Sure, yeah. It was probably laid out and mm-hmm. used and... Uh, this actual, this is the, if you do have the book, A Living Dinosaur, In Search of the McKelly and Bemby, you'll see the final version of this in that book. Very cool. This is what he drew. Very cool. Yeah, pretty neat. Are you going to put pics of it in the Patreon? Uh, there are. There yeah. are on the Patreon. If you're a museum member, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash paramuseum to join. You can actually see high-res versions of this map that we've uploaded. This episode is brought to you by the Newkirk Museum of the Paranormal Membership Program. Become a museum member and take part in live paranormal investigations. Receive Dana's Magic of the Month subscription box, access in-depth artifact case files, and gain access to hundreds of hours of exclusive content available only to members. To become a member, visit patreon.com slash paramuseum. This patch doesn't just have Roy Mackle's name on it. This expedition patch is the Mackle Ragusters expedition. Yes. So we should talk a little bit about Herman Ragusters because this dude was a badass. He absolutely was. This guy was an aerospace engineer. Mm -hmm. He actually worked for JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Yeah. Also, I guess, a fan of explosions. You're right. What (laughs) is it? I don't know. Is this this a profile? Dude, people who are into rockets are inevitably really weird. I mean, Uh, they're obviously, like, really into, like, adrenaline-based things. So it kind of makes sense. I think, like, Jack Parsons. Who yeah. was who founded the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and then became mm-hmm. like a Thelemic ritual magician? Shout out Jack Parsons! Shout out Jack Parsons! <laughs> uh, Shout out Babylon! <laughs> this guy, <laughs> he had a degree in physics, yeah, and he was it says here a skilled grapho analyst. It also says he is not a soft nerd person. <laughs> he is not a soft He's nerd person. The opposite person. of a soft. He's nerd actually person. a hard nerd person. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> true. What is a grapho analyst? List, Connor. Uh, I believe that's somebody who specializes in handwriting analysis. Is that's that cool? Is that like a real thing, or yeah. is that kind of like fringy? I don't think it's necessarily always admissible in court. Yeah, it's kind of like lie detector test. Sure, I, as the way I think about it. Right, but there's, it's definitely cool. It's yeah, how, it's neat. It's how they caught the Unabomber. Oh, oh, no kidding. <laughs> so anyway, this guy, he worked for, for JPL. Yeah. Really weird. A lot of weird dudes end up working for JPL it's at a some weird, point. Yeah, it's a weird, weird thing. But he has access and helps develop this uh, backpack GPS system. And this is in the 80s. So we think of nothing of GPS these days. It's in our phones. It's in everything. Yeah. But back in the day, like it required like huge transponders and stuff. You had to wear backpacks with it. But he was developing... Um, 
technology for use in like the Viking space program team from 1978 to 1980. He worked on Gemini and Apollo. Like this guy was an engineer who designed tons of really cool stuff for space. Brilliant guy. Yeah. Really, really smart guy. Into dinosaurs. He got the he got the Bembe he, itch. He got the Bem <laughs> the Bembe itch sounds like it requires a cream. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it's what it's that stuff that goes up your pee hole when you're trying to go through the swamps. <laughs> is that what that is? <laughs> That's what it is. You get the Bembe itch. Came, came down with a case of the Bembe itch. <laughs> well, it was an itch he could not scratch. <laughs> no cream could clear this itch up except for Roy P. Mackle. <laughs> yeah. He had to he had to smooth some Roy P. Mackle over <laughs> the that <Mac> itch. Man. <laughs> and so he actually wrote and called Mackle numerous times. Yeah. And he was like, listen, I got this shit from the Department of Defense. Like <laughs> yeah. I can I can take some of this stuff off the shelf. They're never gonna miss it. He was like, let's do the ultimate collab. It's exactly. <laughs> he, they did a collab. Yeah. And Mackle was, he convinced Mackle. And Mackle was like, this sounds really cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. You're in. Yeah. So uh, Ragusters was like, I'm going to use our GPS uh, equipment and we'll be able to use that so that you won't get lost. Yeah. Because you're going to an unexplored location. Because I initially was like, oh, are they going to like shoot a dart at the, you know, at the dinosaur and like tra track it around. But it makes absolute sense that if you are out in a place that's very isolated, you probably want people knowing where you are. Yeah, for Specifically sure. Specifically this place. Yes, exactly. Mackle is so impressed by this guy. Not only does he say, yes, like we can go. He says, let's make this a joint expedition. We're going to put your name on it too. Very nice. This is where things get a little bit weird. The, there's a little bit of tension that happens. Yeah. The thing you need to know about Herman Ragusters is not only is this guy a fucking badass explorer, not only is he creating insane uh, stuff for space missions, uses GPS uh, to, to track a, an expedition in the Congo, but this dude is a marketing genius. Yeah, he is uh, making cool patches, thinking yeah. about like the aesthetic and design of things. Yeah. He renames... I don't think he told Mackle he was doing this, but he renames the expedition to the Dino Trek Expedition. Which is a great freaking name. Yeah, I mean, it rolls off the tongue. Yeah. You saw the problems we had with pronouncing this yeah. expedition. It, Dino Trek sounds so fun. It's the 80s. It feels like this yeah. could have been a cartoon, a Saturday morning cartoon, the Dino Trek Expedition. The guy's great. He has these patches designed. Mm -hmm. which, which are awesome. Awesome. You've got, uh, you know, you have a dinosaur and you have uh, a little space satellite floating around out there. It so looks great. It looks fantastic. The it's dude, like all the things that you want from the 80s. He was a marketing genius. Well, without Mackle... He decides he's going to hold a press conference. So June 10th. He was like, listen, <laughs> got he this. watched that interview with Mackle in the, <laughs> in the freaking taxi. And he was like, maybe let's get someone a little bit better on television. He did. Some guy was not like, I'm yeah. going to test my net here in this uh, Chicago, yeah. in the Chicago parking garage. And he's like, uh, I'm much cooler and well-spoken. This will keep the bugs out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So he schedules a. Uh, so he, he, he puts this press conference together okay it's it happened on uh june 10th 1981 okay. at the los angeles museum of natural history okay mackle is not <laughs> happy about it mackle's mad he's so unhappy about it in fact that he <laughs> writes about it in this book oh he did <laughs> he writes about it on page 94 he's real salty he writes I noted at least a dozen errors, <laughs> some minor, but others quite embarrassing. For example, there were references to African alligators. There are no alligators in Africa, only crocodiles. <laughs> I think I said alligators earlier. <laughs> Did oh, you? No. Oh, no. Wait. Way to go, Connor. Uh, Mackle's ghost. Spoiler <laughs> alert, he died. <laughs> yeah. Mackle's ghost is going to haunt you now. <laughs> it's, uh, which might be pretty weird, considering the things we find out about Mackle later. <laughs> That's true. Ragusters is talking about alligators alligators which is making him look like a fool uh he's he talked about pygmy blow darts there's no blow darts in in these tribes they only use crossbows uh he talks about headhunters and can cannibals uh there's nothing like that in the congo republic this is what happens if i have to lead a, a press release <laughs> you're like, just rattling shit off there's crocodiles <laughs> there's there's people with bloat like i'm just coming up with shit off the top of my head and like the, you're over there going like 
you're saying everything saying wrong. Oh, God, no. That's there's... so funny. That is so funny to me. Because well, he was just like trying to get everybody psyched and he's, hyping yeah. everybody up. It's it's a it's a, a verbal rendition of the patches. Yes. He's like, listen, Mackle, you're an old fart. Yeah. Your name for this expedition sucks. I'm going to rename it. Yeah. And I'm going to get people amped for it. I'm going to make us money. Yeah. So we're going to go out there and have this crazy expedition. And do it in a big way. Mackle doesn't like it. Uh-huh. He feels like it makes him look silly because of all the errors. He says, I called Herman to explain that such errors might not matter to a lay person, but any knowledgeable expert reading the press release would doubt our zoological and anthropological competence. But wasn't also Mackle a lay person? I mean, he did not have a degree <laughs> in zoology. <laughs> That dude was like looking into a microscope. He was a willy lay person. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. And he said, uh, Herman blithely dismissed my concern as nitpicking. I mean, I mean, you know, I, I guess can see I can both see, sides. I, I can see both sides. I definitely can. Herman was like, yeah, f- you old man. And he went ahead and he made his patches. He made T-shirts. He made all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing is. I don't think any of them ever got disseminated to the public. Which is a bummer because they bummer. are awesome. These things, like we have a stack of stickers and a stack of these patches. And I bet you that they were just prototypes. Probably. And yeah. and that's it. I've never seen anything like this ever before, ever. The only mentions to Dino Trek uh, are on the patch. Mm-hmm. And then there's mentions to them planning an expedition like in this book. There's nothing else that exists. There's like stuff from the press conference and the news. This is it. Yeah. So it just never made it beyond the prototype no. uh, point. No, this is it because their relationship uh, breaks down pretty hard at this point. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know. Maybe Mackle thought the stuff was tacky. It's so cool. What do you mean, tacky? I think it's cool. I just think it's the difference between like a creative mind and a scientific mind. Sure. And I think Herman Ragusters probably had both of those things. I get it. I get it. Jack Bryan uh, was one of the main funders. Yeah, he's, oh, yeah. The, he's the money. Yeah, he's the money man. He's And what the funny thing is, is that he's like, oh, I'll give you a lot of money mm-hmm. <laughs> if I can go too. Right. Yeah. Uh, he, can you blame him? Yeah. No, no. He's a, so was he, he not like go. a Texan, like a big talking Texan with yeah. lots of money, and he wants to go see a dinosaur? God, how is this not a movie? I know it literally <laughs> should be. Should be. Somebody needs to write this screenplay. <laughs> uh, so he makes up contracts. Jack Bryan makes up contracts for everybody. Ragusters did not like the contracts. Uh, he had okay. a problem with them. Uh, on page ninety-five in Mackle's book, mm-hmm. he says. Talking once again by phone, I emphasized to Herman that this was my expedition, that I was the expedition leader, and that although I was prepared to listen to his opinions and advice, the final decision in important matters would have to be mine. I'm going to stop for a second and go, why'd you put his f***ing name on the patch then? Yeah, I feel like what happened was they were like two, they were bros, and they were like, let's be best friends forever. And then it started right. li- little by little breaking down. And right. he was like, oh, I've made a huge mistake. If he were willing to continue under those clearly stated conditions, fine. If not, we would have to part company. On July 9th, I received a hostile, threatening two-page letter from Herman. In addition to a personal attack on me, Herman demanded the return of all equipment in my hands, his passport and visa obtained by me for him, and insisted that I neither use nor display his copyright logo. Can you imagine writing a super pissed off letter and then having to put it in the mail? Dude. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we're so used to just being able to like, argue with people on Twitter, but just being like, God. You know what the worst and part about that is? folding it and putting it in an envelope, <laughs> licking the envelope, like putting it in a mailbox. That's and, so funny. And then you have like a solid four days to regret it. <laughs> immediately you're like i definitely overreacted yeah. damn well, it so the press conference was on june 10th and mackle gets this uh this this letter from him on mm. july 9th so okay. less than a month this entire expedition has broken down yeah all right it's that's it i appreciate the merch was like the first thing on his uh-huh. mind yeah i know that's a real uh-huh. mind right yeah. there uh-huh. mackle makes a really funny comment about it too like after that line about like and you can't use my my logo he makes a comment that's like that's fine with me because i wasn't going to use them anyway <laughs> oh. I, didn't, I didn't even like it anyway it's like two kids <sighs> on a playground arguing with each other things might have worked out for the better because this is the deal they go on two separate 
expeditions. Yeah, so we get essentially two very different treks. Two very different treks. Mm -hmm. This is the sad thing, though. Mackle's stuff is really well documented. Yeah. Because uh, he writes this, like, thick book about this. Yes. Um, Herman doesn't write a book. I think there's, like, a pamphlet that he gave out for a while, mm -hmm. but there's there's no book. Nobody's talking about Herman's kick-ass expedition. Mm -hmm. Herman has, like, the awesome expedition of the two. Trace One. It's called Trace One, the Ragusters African Congo Expedition. Awesome. Happened in 1981. It, uh, it spanned 40 miles in five days through dense, bug-filled swamps and jungles. And he is the first Westerner to ever reach Lake Telly. Yeah, he does it. That's killer. That is, uh, I'm assuming, hard. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> Real hard. So not only is he the first Westerner to actually step foot into Lake Telly, he's mm -hmm. the first person to get there from the West. Yeah. But he and his wife see the monster. Yes, they do. They see the dinosaur. And they not only not only do they see the dinosaur, they take a picture of it mm -hmm. and they take audio of it. The audio is kind of scary. The picture... I mean, the picture is Not exactly so what you think it's going to be. It's like a blurry black and white picture of probably an elephant. But um, like, <laughs> we we can we can look at it. We'll analyze it yeah. real quick. Or a hippo, maybe. Yeah. Right. If you're watching the video podcast, you can see it on screen right now. Yeah, it's spooky. It's interesting. It's something big that's in the lake. It's a shiny little guy in there. Yeah. Just swimming around. It's kind of cute. So we have to consider. This is a massive lake. We don't really know <laughs> what the distance is, so we can't really judge how big it is. Mm -hmm. Me looking at this thing, I see a hippopotamus. Yeah, I personally, can, I get it. Maybe you see something different. Maybe I don't know. You do. What do you see? Leave it in the comments. Yeah, let us know what you think this is in the comments. It's cool that he was even at the lake at all. All of this stuff aside, <laughs> he's already made history. What do you think the what like right when they pulled up? Do you what do you think that the McKelly and Bambe said to them? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well we can we can hear what it said to them because there's audio. I think that the McKelly and Bambe said, "Welcome to Chili's. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> welcome to Lake Tilly. <laughs> welcome to Lake Tilly. Welcome to Tilly's. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's what here's what he sounded like. This is what he recorded. I mean, it's creepy. It is. Pretty cool. Growling, kind of howling sound. Not only does he make history, he's got f***ing killer merch. He's got a kick-ass name, mm -hmm. Trace One. Yeah. He sees the monster, yeah. takes a photo of it, and takes audio mm -hmm. of it. And then he comes back, and that's really all we ever hear about it. I mean, maybe that's all he. Maybe he was satisfied with that. It's you know? the best. He got to do it with his wife, which is awesome. That's the cool. two of them did it together. Should we go look for the McKelly and Bambi? No. No, you don't want to do this? <laughs> no way, man. Come on. No. It'd be fun. Are it's you... only 40 miles through the yeah, swamp. Yeah, it'll be really fun when bugs crawl, swim up your pee hole, and uh, <laughs> I'm eaten alive by venomous, venom spitting bugs. I hate the hot weather. That's I hate true. humidity. You do. You do. Uh, somewhere very early on in the trek, <laughs> I would like fall down and I just go, leave me. Yeah. <laughs> just come back and give me when you're done. Keep yeah. going. I keep going. Go and without it, me. Yeah, go without, it wouldn't be that bad. It would be like, I'm just tired and dehydrated. No, you know what would happen is that would happen. You'd be like, I'm going back to the hotel. Yeah. You go back to the hotel. I'm gone for a couple weeks and I come back and I've got a photo and a video and you're like, that's it? <laughs> yeah, it's that photo and video. That's what would happen. I'm like, that doesn't look like a Bembe boy to me. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Uh, at the same time, 1981, uh, Mackle, he hits the road <laughs> and he decides he's going to go on a second expedition. Yes. Keelan, you want to tell us about this second expedition? Oh, man. Let's hear it. Back Let's to the Mackle files. I would love to. <laughs> First off, after uh, Ragoosters and Mackle part ways, Mackle renames the expedition to the Mackle Bryan expedition. Oh, oh harsh. Oh. Yep. After the, the main funder of the Sure. Of the, the Texan. Expedition. Brian ends up not going because <laughs> his doctor 
tells him that he has a banana allergy <laughs> <laughs> and, he, mm-hmm. and he shouldn't go soft nerd people i like that this never came up prior to this like his doctor was like listen you've got an extreme banana allergy <laughs> you know what allergy, that is sir. no 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 this is what it is you the guy's like out. the guy come came up with the worst excuse he could <laughs> yes, yeah. where he's like man I, he's like looking at it yeah. he's like oh man is that hot there He's, oh yeah, man, there's that many bu- there's that many bugs there. Yeah, he's doing the. Oh man, I got a banana allergy. I can't go on this. <laughs> That's like him going. I have ingrown toenails. I can't. I can't <laughs> yeah. do this. Bone spurs. That's exactly it. He was he was doing the math and going. This is gonna suck. Oh this man, is not gonna be fun. So the guy whose name is on the expedition doesn't even go. Yes, he does <laughs> still fund like most of it. Good for All him. All right, um, That's good. It, it Mackle was like, okay, that's fine. You don't have to go, but like, what about the money? Right. And he was like, no, 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 you're good. I'll still, <laughs> I'll still do that. Mackle ends up going. He goes with a photographer, two students. One of them is like a grad student, and then um, they meet up with Gene Thomas, the missionary again, and then they hire uh, three more porters. This is also technically a joint venture with the Congolese government. Wow, so like the government was yeah. like, yeah, this sounds sweet. We want in. Yeah. It goes very similarly to the last one. They're okay. going sort of in the same direction, but they do have their own possible close encounter this Ooh. time. On page 132, he says that they're in, it, it's called a dugout. It's like a really long kind of canoe-like boat. Sure. I think we have a photo of him yes, in it in yeah. the collection. We'll we'll show the uh, video listeners. Um, and that one, he actually got made specifically for this expedition. It's like an extra oh, long. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, it's like mm. an extra long one. Cool. Um, and so they're in this boat, and they hear a big plop sound in the water. <laughs> All right. <laughs> With like a wave. And then everyone freaks out. Like the way it's written in the book is so frantic. Really? And they're like moving around. They're trying to find like where it came from. And then of course, like there's nothing. They don't see anything there. Mm. But one of the porters that was in the front of the boat, he says that he saw like the back of a creature. Oh, wow. Like go under the water around that time. So it's going to capsize their boat. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. How big of a plop? How big them. of a plop are we talking? Well, well, so he <laughs> describes it as like a giant plop, and then he's like, and then a wave of like 25 centimeters. And I was like, how much is that? And I looked it up, and it was like nine inches. I was like, the plop it thickens. A, it was a medium plop. And this is when I think he was probably really regretting not having regroosters with him because he does get lost. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they, get, they get lost on the river trying to like find their way to the next like village that they're trying to go to because there's so much of this like floating grass and they can't tell like where they're supposed oh. to be going and it makes it like really hard to like paddle yeah. through the water too they make land and they they're like oh my god we're gonna have to like camp out here and then this guy just like shows up like paddling down the river and they're like oh thank god and he's from the village that they're trying to get to and he's like it's just it's down here oh wow <laughs> and then this is really spooky so they're on the Lakola River and they come across this like abandoned Western style house. Really? Mm. And there's kind of like this kind of ghost story around it. There's like it's one of the stories is like this Congolese soldier came home from like World War Two and built it and then he died slash went crazy and he's like still in the woods um, oh, what? So they like get out of the boat to go investigate this house, and then Mackle realizes that he has had dreams about this house. Oh, dude, I love this so much. <laughs> Precognitive dreams. He's had dreams about this house for the past like four to five years, even before he even considered going oh, to Africa. God. So the dream goes that he's standing in this like grassy field that's behind the house and he turns around, there's this big elephant coming at him. And so he turns and he runs into the house and then the elephant is gone. Like he expects like this big crash and then nothing happens and the the elephant is gone. And so he's in the house and he starts looking around and there's like a, there's like wine glasses knocked over and like a game of dom, like half finished game of dominoes. And it's kind of like, Whoever left, left very quickly to, like, abandon this place. Um, And then he sees a marble staircase leading downstairs. And he says, I see 
he goes down the staircase and he says, I see red marbled corridors, several arches, columns, and pilasters, vaguely classical Greco-Roman in design. As I descend, waves of vertigo rise from the pit of my stomach. A vast underground array of structures extend to who knows how far. And then he wakes up. Whoa. Yeah. Now, if I'm not mistaken, he doesn't talk about this shit at all in the rest no. of the book. No. There's just this weird, random, precognitive dream. Yes. And this is the other weird thing. One of the things that we found while going through uh, the boxes that we have of Mackle's stuff is we find like this 20 page, some handwritten letter to his wife during one of these expeditions. And in the letter, he's talking about all the precognitive dreams that he has. That is so weird. So like this guy who's, a, by all accounts, a serious scientist, like he's mad at Herman Regusters because he's marketing it too much. He's getting details wrong. The guy is is pretty well respected among his peers. He's keeping these like weird things a secret that he's into precognition. The other thing that we started to find in all of his files were paperwork about parapsychological research. Yeah. Like he's got stuff in there by George P. Hansen, mm -hmm. who we reference a lot because of his book, The Trickster and the Paranormal. And he's a parapsychologist, a pretty well respected parapsychologist. So it turns out this guy wasn't just weird in his dinosaur. Yeah, it was spreading. One bug bites you. Yeah. And then you get into the rest of it. The, the dream thing is interesting too, because it's like, is he so on the surface he feels very chaotic yeah and underneath like his what he's seeking for is something that feels like it's a higher uh oh so you're deciphering desire. this dream yeah because like he walks into a house first of all he's chased into a house right by like a large creature yeah and when he gets inside it's messy things are kind of half in play things are like there's a sense of chaos going on right unfinished business unfinished business and then there's like then he descends into a staircase into a beautiful place so it's as if like his subconscious mind is saying like you have have to like you know you've got to go deeper into it before you can find exactly what you're looking for the beautiful scene that you're looking for i told keelan the other day we were talking about this these letters we were like reading through them and talking about this dream and there's a part of me that can't help but go if your mind is precognitive it's very interesting that it's an elephant that chases you into this house. Yeah, the the animal that's... When one of the skeptical arguments yeah. is that people are misidentifying mm -hmm. elephants. Yeah. And that's what they're calling the McKelly and Bembe. That's true. So maybe there was like the, the elephant chasing him into the house represents like his unconscious fears that... Sure. That oh, everything's very disorganized and he's not finding the flow. Oh, man. Do you know what I mean? I love that detail so much. <laughs> I'm weird. so glad he put that in the book. It's so weird. And, and, like, in reality, when he goes into the house, like, the details of, like, the wine glasses and the domino game are true. They're mm -hmm. actually there. They're actually there. Oh, Whoa. That's even weirder. There's no marble staircase, but the other things are, are true. Weird. Yeah. God, that's crazy. It's very, it's really weird. And that doesn't, like, there's no other mention of this? It no, doesn't go anywhere? It, do it goes literally nowhere. It's just, like, a page, and then we move on to... The dino stuff. Wow. <laughs> After the whole house thing, um, they meet up with this, like, this hunter. And he's, the way they describe him, he's kind of like the talk of the town. He's like the guy. And he says that he tracked the Makili and Bembe through the woods not too long ago. And so he leads them to where he tracked the creature. And when they're there... It's very clear that a large creature did pass through this area. Like the branches mm. are broken and the the grass is like trampled down. This hunter, the reason that he thought it was weird, there was something about the way that the grass was like trampled down. Like it would have like between the tracks, like it wouldn't have been an elephant to make it like that. Like an elephant's stomach wouldn't have reached Oh, sure. I see like what the, you mean. The length of the grass. Got yeah. it. And then he also says that every elephant that he had tracked, like, it, so it's going into the river. Yeah. Every elephant that he's tracked going into the river, he always finds where the elephant has come out of the river. And he can't find. Oh, oh. weird. 
weird. So something yeah. went into the water and is using the water then as a, a channel for movement. It like right. hasn't come out. Right. Weird. I think we have photos of this in his files too. Mm -hmm. You we do, do I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll put these uh, on screen. After that, um, they continue on their way. They keep uh, interviewing people and then they go home. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. No dinosaur. No dinosaur. Okay. Well, the, if you look at the, if you think about the real list, um, so Herman Raguster's expedition saw the thing, heard it, recorded it, took a picture. First Westerner to reach re Lake Telly, and uh, Mackel's second expedition is is a is a plop and meeting yep. uh, a hunter and having a weird and dream and, and having, having a, a weird, weird dream, <laughs> <laughs> and he's the hardcore scientist. But should have got should have should have gone with Ragusters. Cool. That you should have had that guy. These patches would have been real great on your on the side of your uh, on yeah, the side dude. of your adventure outfit. I love that he like condensed the whole thing too. He's like, "I'm here. Let's see this. Oh, there it is." And then, bye. <laughs> like that's it. There's just nothing else to it. For some reason, it's still it's still Roy Mackle that everybody associates with the Macaulay and Bemby during that time period. In fact, he one of the things that we found while going through all these boxes of his material is. He's got folders full of resumes from mm. people who want to go on these expeditions with him. Yeah. Um, there's one that's, uh, where is it? Uh, hold on. Uh, missing, some, has somebody seen the folder of all of the, of all this stuff? Um, oh, here we go. Here we go. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, check this out. This guy here is, uh, he writes from Ontario and he includes a photo with his resume that shows how dedicated he is to the search for the Mokelly and Bemby. He really wants in. Yeah. He really wants in. Dedicated. There's other cool stuff in here. There's people who are trying to make television shows with Roy. Roy did not seem to care very much. Like this one's for <laughs> Dinosaurs Live. This is a whole pitch for a television show. There's tons. There's letters in here from all kinds of different people who can bring all kinds of different skills to the table. Um if you were if you were writing to Roy Mackle, it's nineteen it's the mid nineteen eighties, and you're gonna try and sell yourself to Roy. What would your skills be? What's your skill set you're bringing to the hunt? I I can be sarcastic, <laughs> and I can also get snacks. Oh, I can get snacks. Okay, I can do that. All right. I'll be. I'll get snacks and be sarcastic. What do you think you'd bring, Connor? I think that I could stand up in the canoe without falling down. <laughs> That's definitely number one thing that you should be able to That's do. True. Mm -hmm. That's true. I heard he idea. was looking for people like that. Yeah, <laughs> That's... a high center of balance. <laughs> Keelan. The dead weight that passes out halfway through the swamp. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know what? Uh, monster bait. Yeah. Right. There yeah. you go. There yep. you go. I'm. You know, listen. I'm into marketing. Mm -hmm. I think I could do a pretty decent job with the marketing. Yeah. Um, we should, Carl. What would you What would you bring to the table? <laughs> An undeniable sense of enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Carl. everybody. Carl Pfeiffer, award award winning director, Pellier. cameo Le appearance, the Crone documentary that's uh -huh. coming out. Uh, this is what we do to the guy who makes us famous. Yep. Stick him in a dinosaur costume, make him walk in the background for a bit. On that note, we're going to leave you on a cliffhanger. We'll see you again two Mondays from now, and we'll see where we land on this crazy legend. There's so much more to this case. Just wait till we get into creationism. You're going to hate it. On the next episode of the Haunted Objects Podcast. I can't even wrap my head around it. Feels like a lot of denial. Here's the thing. It is a hard thing to wrap your head around. So we took a work field trip the other day. To hell on earth. <laughs> the Ark Encounter is down in Kentucky, and it is a full-scale replica of Noah's Ark, and it doubles as a creation museum. The Haunted Objects Podcast is hosted by Greg and Dana Newkirk, produced by Connor J. Randall, with photography directed by Carl Pfeiffer and features exclusive artifacts from the new Kirk Museum of the Paranormal. To learn more about the artifacts featured in this episode, take part in live interactive experiments and enjoy exclusive Haunted Objects content. Become a museum member at patreon.com slash paramuseum. This has been a Planet Weird production.
fun to stay at the YMCA. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and we're ready and rolling. <laughs> 